All right. My name is uh, Calvin Caspit. I'm the uh, subsistence staff biologist for the uh, Forest Service here in the Alaska region. I'm stationed in Juneau. And um, what, I've, what, we're gonna, what I've put together here, what we put together is, uh, is, is kind of a, a, quick, a quick overview of our fisheries resource monitoring program that we undertake with uh, tribal governments here in Southeast. So I'm going to give a quick overview of that. And then um, we've got uh, three case studies that um, um, that will be uh, talking about their particular projects uh, with their communities. Um, Lisa Lang here, um, she's substituting in for Anthony Christensen uh, for um, Heidelberg and their project at Hanna Lake. Um, have uh, Ben Van Allen, he's with our Juneau Ranger District and he works with the communities of Angoon and, and Huna on a bunch of projects in that area. And then later on I have Charles Russells from Sitka Tribe coming in and he's going to talk about his, uh, the project that Sitka Tribe has at Clag Lake, which is north of town here a little ways. Um, so um, I'm just going to dive right into this, this uh, slideshow here. Um, <coughs> basically everything we do in the Fisheries Resource Monitoring Program comes from the NILCA, the Nas Alaska National In Interest Lands Conservation Act in 1980. You know, as most of you know, it created most, most of the national parks, refuges, and wildernesses in Alaska, as well as provided for subsistence in Title VIII of the NOAA. Um, just the definition, the definition of uh, subsistence from uh, Anilka. Um, it uh, talks about um, subsistence being more than just food. Um, I know there's uh, a lot more to the to the concept of subsistence, but this is the best. Shot. This is the shot that Congress took at it. Um, I just want to talk about some of the key, compo key components of Anilka. Um, the 802 talks about um, uh, how we should cooperate with, with um, adjacent landowners and land managers. Um, it talks about how um, uh, rural subsistence uh, users should have a meaningful role in um, in in the subsistence program. Talks about um, and then uh, 804 talks about this priority, this uh, priority for subsistence uses that should be granted. Um, uh, Section 810 requires our agencies to consider the effects of what we do on land um, and how it affects subsistence resources. Um, uh, 811 talks about reasonable access, and what I'm going to talk about for the rest of the uh, pr presentation here in the Fisheries Resource Monitoring Program is this thing about research in cooperation with others. So Section 812 is the part of ANILCA that directs us to work, um, in this case, with uh, tribal government. So I just want to throw that in there. Um, those are the federal lands in Alaska. And down there in southeast, you can see it's all uh, Forest Service administered lands. That's why uh, we're um, the continent. we're the agency that works with uh, tribal governments here to do this issue of use much Again, 812. This is a full text of 812. It tells that the secretaries, in, in cooperation with the state and other agencies, undertaking this research with uh, the state, local, and regional uh, state, local, and, and uh, regional councils and, and working with others and giving uh, local residents um, part, making rural residents part of uh, the management program. So our monitoring program, we established it in, in uh, the year 2000 after we expanded our jurisdiction into uh, federal waters. Um, our purpose is to supplement ongoing research and monitoring efforts. This is a big one. We focus on capacity building with our affected tribal government. Um, capacity building is, is giving the tools to local tribal governments to conduct research, con conduct the monitoring, develop the, the numbers that are used in management, and participate in the management planning process. And we focus on stocks, stock status and trends, harvest monitoring, and traditional ecological knowledge. We have programs, uh, projects in all three of those areas. Uh, we have a biannual call for proposals. Um, 
um, I have a, I'll have a handout here that I'll, I'll send around, but it basically starts on the even years. Uh, we'll have a call for proposals on the even years in January, the January of even years. That's the beginning of the process. Um, proposals come in from uh, the public, from, the, from proponents, people who are interested in doing this work. Um, there's those uh, proposals are submitted to the um, Office of Assistance Management and the Technical Review Committee, of which I sit on. The Technical Review Committee is made up of uh, representatives of each of the five federal agencies and representatives of the That technical, technical Review Committee <coughs> recommends projects for funding and approval to the Regional Advisory Council. And then the council will make a recommendation on every one of the projects that were submitted. Um, okay, the, the re and then they recommend make those recommendations to the Federal Subsistence Board. And then the Federal Subsistence Board will approve them. And then contracts are awarded. This takes about a year and a half from beginning to end. From when the, the proposals are, when we get the call for proposals out to when the contracts are actually it's a pretty involved process. The TRC, uh, we spend a lot of time going over all these projects. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Harold. <laughs> um, I just wanted to, th these two slides just kind of show the, the, the history of uh, funding for the program since the beginning. If you notice there, um, there's a slow ramp up of funding. Um, up until the mid middle mid O's, uh, 05, 06, um, at the peak. Um, and that tracking up was basically building that capacity in, these tribal gov in the tribal governments to do the work. By um, 06, um, that capacity had been built. And then beginning in 07, it starts to go down again. And it isn't because we lost capacity in the tribes, it's because we lost funding. Uh, basically, we've been dealing with some funding issues for the past uh, three or four years that are causing us to uh, uh, cut back on investments in this program. So this is a list of some of the uh, tribal governments that we've worked with over the over the past 10, uh, 12 years, um, um, from from uh, north to south. Um, when we began, we were doing a lot more work in South Central Alaska, but because of our drop off in funding, we, um, we've been kind of concentrating here in the southeast now. This is just an example of some of the work that uh, gets done. Every line there is a, is a project that was completed. Um, each of those lines there has a completed uh, project report that you can go on to OSM's website and uh, download. So virtually, and this is like five years old now, so this list is a lot longer. And uh, in one of my handouts that I'll hand out, there's actually some websites you can go on and to actually download all those reports. I just wanted to talk. Um, I just wanted to talk about one project. I know I was going to give the overview, which I did, um, but I want to talk about one project up north and how a traditional ecological knowledge in a in a stock status and trends project how that worked out and how successful that was. But uh, for Copper River Chinook monitoring, what they have is these big fish wheels um, uh, low in Copper River down in Bear Canyon. Um, those fish wheels work, they capture the fish, the fish are tagged. Um, and then upriver, um, there's some similar fish wheels that are going on at river where they catch the fish again. They look at the fraction of marked and unmarked fish to to, give an, uh, to uh, come up with an estimate of the run size. And for a system as large as the Copper River, it's, that's huge. So like I said, uh, um, this in, it included road, radio tagging for distribution and run timing, and they also did some uh, genetic stock sample, uh, genetic sampling. This is what I want, this is the project, that, this is where TEK comes in. You notice that fish wheel there, it's a lot smaller. This was a traditionally designed uh, fish wheel by an elder, uh, Johnny Goodlikoff, who lives up in the upper uh, Copper River. He took a look at those big fish wheels that were put together by the scientific staff and said, those may work down at the lower river, but they're not gonna work up here. 
and so he designed a smaller uh, fish wheel, placed it in a different place where um, we, the, the, the scientists would have normally put it. Um, he designed and placed this fish wheel. Um, you know, like I said, traditionally designed and placed. Um, and it outfishes the other fish wheels four to one combined. So it, it increased the catch, it increased the statistical reliability of the project. And, uh, and it's all because of, of, of an elder that came in and said, hey, let me help you. And uh, the, the, uh, uh, the folks who were doing this said, well, we need your help, we want it. And so that's how that worked. It worked out really well. And like I said, it greatly improved the statistical validity of the study and improved it a great deal. Um, those are some of the, uh, <clears throat> you go to that first website there, that's where you can go down and download all those uh, uh, completed project reports. And there's some other stuff. Um, I have copies of this on my, my handout that I'll give out and you guys can have those. <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to... Uh, Turn it over to Lisa, uh -oh. and uh, she can uh, she'll talk about her uh, project at Heaven. Well, just give me a second to bring that up. Okay, hi everybody. My name is Lisa Lang. Um, my Haida name is Kael Juice, and I hail from Heidelberg, Alaska. Um, one of the things that I wanted to acknowledge um, before I started was to thank the Good Sitka people for welcoming us here today. Um, this week we spent at the Cultural Tourism Conference was outstanding. My boss, Doreen Whitwer, is here with me today. She's the administrator for the um, Heidelberg Cooperative Association. And I can tell you, I can't give a perspective um, any better than what it's like to live and be in the village because that's what we do. We live and we, we, we um, we're the everyday people in the communities that oftentimes you hear it talked about, but um, you don't really get a sense for um, that relationship unless you meet people like Vereen and myself. And the one reason that I'm here today is um, I need to do a little explanation. Anthony Christensen, the gentleman that um, I'm standing in for today, Anthony is our mayor in Heidelberg. Um, he is also recently appointed to the Federal Subsistence Board. And so him and a gentleman from Barrow, I believe they're the first two native Alaskan natives, plus they are subsistence users. They are people who actually go out and, and subsist. They, they, it's, a, it's a way of living, and um, that is our way of life. That, and I know the Thinket people have their words, and they're very similar. It's not called subsistence. It's the way that we live our life. And I know, um, like I was saying, uh, thank you for uh, having the Haida people on um, Sitka Kwan, um, Kiksadi, the lands here. I really am greatly appreciative. Anthony wanted to be home this week. He's been out at his first federal hearings, um, board meetings, and um, we're very proud of him, and so what he did was he called my boss, Doreen, and he said, can you ask Lisa to speak for me? And, he's, and she, he's smart, see, because I can't say no now, and Doreen asked me, and I did it. So I'm very honored to be here because Tony, um, Tony was instrumental in meeting with our elders in Heidelberg. That's the very first step that he did, and I think that they, there was a gentleman named Bob Schroeder who came years ago, around 2000, and he said to me, I'm in this radical division of the fishing game, and Lisa, white people like numbers. He said, that's what they like. They like to read numbers. And I said, okay, and introduced him to some of the people, and the counting started. And Hedda, for your information, is a sacred site. That is one of our sacred sites to the Haidas, and um, one of the big protections that um, this, this work with Cal does is it offers scientifically based information that's um, done locally. And so they respect the traditional knowledge. They have to. Their numbers now match what has been known forever. It just backs up the local people to say. And I wish Tony was here. Um, I'll go through his presentation, but I do want you to, I called him up this morning, and, or he called me, and he said he's going to pay me in fishing when I get home. 
and he said that um, one of the notes he wants me to bring forward to you is the importance of community involvement. And this project over the years has been um, a, a community project. Sockeye was recognized as a priority in the community, and we were having problems with monitoring, we were having problems with different issues in the community. So recognizing that, to engage the community in actually doing the surveys, doing, starting to be involved more in the projects. And it was Cal sitting here that said to Tony, why don't you take over the projects? Why does the force, or the, why do we as an agency tell you we're going to take your numbers and we'll go count them for you? Why don't you do it yourself? And he said, okay. And we hired Kathy Needham, who's a, a Native woman and a scientist. And she now finishes the reports and works and monitors. And we're what's called one of the low risk projects. There's not a lot of risk in giving the money and making sure the project gets done in Heidelberg. OK, so Tony just says to let everyone know that um, we did a lot of voluntary community um, not fishing, hands off, monitoring when it wasn't time. Even when the state didn't regulate it, the feds didn't regulate it, we self-regulated. And so that's really important. And the fisheries, if there was no sockeye, if it was a coho year, if it was a whatever else year, that's what the people fished. They did not take the sockeye because they knew they know the three cycles that run through Hada and they knew how important it was. So I'll run through his, I'll start now. So, sorry, Cal. And there's um, numerous projects in Heidelberg, and Hedda was identified as the primary area. Um, Hedda was also logged in the 40s, and it had a detrimental effect on our community, a detrimental effect. And our elders don't forget that because you can maybe you don't have jobs in your community, but if you don't have fish, your village doesn't exist. So that was a huge, huge issue for the local people. Um, and it just states there what I'm saying. And this is a high use system for our subsistence use. It's kind of located down from our village, so it's isolated, but um, commercial fisheries is another issue that came into play, so. Okay, and this is how it started. I think I already told you there's um, uh, the Fisheries Resource Monitoring Program began it, and then after a while, Heidelberg took over, the tribe itself took over the project. The weir, there, you'll see a picture of the weir coming up, and you'll see people that are working the weir, local Native people that um, do an outstanding job. They, they are a model in, in taking local people that just really pride themselves on this summer job. So, um, and the project data is used um, over time um, to justify the things that we need in the, in the future funding. Okay. okay, there's a big picture of, you'll see Heidelberg up in the top there, Saquon Island. Those are just different traditional areas within our, and there's a little box up there. So that's just a nice map. <laughs> Go ahead. And that's southern, southern Prince of Wales. Okay, um, those were the objectives right there for um, the project itself. Um, the surveying of all the subsistence fishers on the fishing grounds. And that's a simple thing to say, but one of the things they did was locally count uh, the number of fish and then get uh, local people to do those surveys because one of the issues was trust. You know, there was a trust issue. You know, who are we going to tell these non-native people the real true amount of fish that we take? Well, when you have your own people doing the surveys, there's just a tendency to, to you know, be more honest. Plus, Heidelberg had 100% survey returns every year. And so they were wondering, how they came down and they said, how do you do that? They said, well, you hire your own people, number one, and you hire people that trust each other because then you get good information. Um, Let's see, roughly estimate the escapement of the early runs. You'll see the weir and you'll see the, the, the Y forest. And in their testing, they do estimate the age, the length, and the composition of the uh, sockeye um, escapement for HEDA. Okay, the primary method is the Creel survey, and that's the interview. And that's what I was talking about. Those are the interviews that were conducted, and really a great return, 100%. Um, Again, you'll see the fish were coming up to count the fish. This year, they're going to try a little different method with a camera than the old fashioned. You'll see someone looking through a bucket in a little bit because they have to get an idea of what's, what they're counting. 
and then there's the scale sample measure and determine the gender of a you'll see a little uh, picture of someone taking all the count and each row is the, the data that's collected either daily or half a day for the um, individuals out in the field and they have done an outstanding job okay and this again is just the, the questions that will come up in the survey and that's the picture out in Heta, and that is the weir. And there's the little camp shack where the guys stay, and um, the little platform where they do the counting. And there's the there's the fish weir. Okay, there's the fish. <laughs> and there's there's somebody looking through the bottom of a bucket. And so this is going to change this year. They're going to actually use a camera. So, yeah. And there's the there's the data sheet with the count and they pencil in they sit there and count and all the um, different um, uh, subject the scales uh, you know the different uh, length the different things that they're monitoring they mark through in their book and keep a log and then Kathy Needham who oversees and works with Tony and Doreen um, comes down and they send her she goes out on the boat in it's a good 45 minute ride down out of our village and they she oversees and makes sure everything's in order so it's a real top-notch program and this is just an idea of the subsistence harvest and then the 2011 numbers were estimates at the time that this this slide was made and so it has to get updated I'll get on Tony for that I joke. <laughs> okay and this is just a little graph that shows the the daily weir counts and I think if you knew who the individuals were in our community and if you said to me tw 10 years ago this young man is going to be a person who counts fish every day and does an outstanding record job you would have said no way and they have a real rich uh, attachment to doing their job and doing it well and and it comes up with scientific data okay. alrighty just yeah yeah yeah, and we have three rums. Uh, Head is an unusual system. It's always been unusual. The locals knew that, um, and it's um, it, because of the commercial use. I think the locals, especially, were concerned about when those runs were going to be more. What they were doing was getting more exact on when those runs were occurring and the numbers for each run. So it's really important, especially if you are a subsistence user. It's crucial because if you know you're not going to have one good run, you can always bank on that next run or the final third run. But if your numbers aren't coming back, you, you know you're going to head into something where you can anticipate on how to do another fishery or substitute. And that's the sockeye returns, the weir count, the estimated harvest, and the estimated return. If you could see Hedda, you would say that is quite a producing little area for such a small stream it's just it's kind of a kind of a uh, gift of nature that it's really a beautiful place and it's uh, it's quite it's highly unusual it's, to me anyway <laughs> okay um, let's see what happened in 2000 those because that's what happens even in cycles of nature even e there's gonna be down years everybody who subsists knows that or it could have been a, a number of things. It could have been the commercial fishery, and I think there was an interception, and they've even addressed that. The, the, the people at home knew or could guesstimate better when that run was going to be and really advocated for the fishery to open the commercial fishery after that final run. And so they didn't scoop up 20,000 stock, or you know, the fish that, that would have been used for subsisting counts. That's how good this monitoring is. That's why this is the science pays off, and they knew it, so they they went ahead and said, "Okay, this is probably when it's going to happen," and then addressed it. And it does happen, whether it's commercial or just something that nature brings to us. You have to be prepared for it. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, just to add in there, I, I know I did talk to Tony about that, but um, actually, <laughs> as a result of that number. Picked up in 2005, we actually went to Fish and Game and got Fish and Game to move the markers back. Yeah, that's a, right. It's a it's a CSU unit. Yeah. Um, you know, they have the closure lines. You know, 
fishing game has all these closure lines across all the bays. So, based on this information, Tony was actually able to get a fishing game and move that line back further out. And they so, missed so the fish. That's why we got in later years, we got to start getting better escape fish that line. Tony said that he watched them fish that fish. I remember. Yeah. He said he actually watched them. Now that you bring back my the thought about it, he he said he watched them take that fish and a commercial fishery and take it. And he said, I can't remember how he said he was really ashamed of it because there was people fishing it, you know, who were making their living. You know, we we come from fishing people, you know, but we also come from people that are going to suffer because of those numbers. And so, um, yeah, he did. It's a it's a recognized unit that's protected. It's a it, it is a subsistence unit. Yeah, he was pretty proud of that. So he re he rectified himself and had it pulled back. So thanks, Cal. All righty. Oh yeah. Now see, this is all. <laughs> this is done. Tony Cal came to Heidelberg and visited, and th this was done right before they had all their final numbers. So. Um, so you won't know, and I won't know until he changes his slide presentation. It was a good year. We had a great year this year, Hadar. Huh, yeah, we did. We had a really great year. Very, we're all happy, and we all have fish. <laughs> so, okay, that's just another. That's when it. The weird. Some. That's the weird. But at at of but it, they have. They had a. It, it'll flood out too, and those are issues that Tony was talking about. Just being prepared for things like that. If you know, nature is its own. You know, it's harsh sometimes, and be prepared. So, yeah. Oh, this is Lee Charles, and he's one of the um, he's one of the counters, and I think this is the gentleman I was talking about. See where head house how it's surrounded. And there's fresh, fresh uh, spring wells around the side of it, but it's environmentally so sensitive because of where it sits, like in a bowl, and the streams that go up and off of there. And it's, it's, um, it's a, it's a gift of nature. It really is. It's a beautiful place. And this is just the numbers. This is really Kathy Needham, our scientist, what she's collected and what she's reported back for us from this study. And all of the guys that work over there um, collect it, understand it, and um, very proud of them, very proud of this project. It's, it is a model project. So. Because of the long-term data, we're able to refine the project to make it more efficient and accurate. That's certainly true. And um, again, the data to show that Heda Lake remains the primary system for sockeye. It's used by the tribe, the feds, and the state to make management decisions, like what Tony did when he brought it to the state and said, hey, you have to back off because we're really low on numbers. Um, I think I would also say that it's helping on the future sockeye stocks. And one of the other things, and I just I have to say this, I know this is probably going to get me fired, but I'll say it. No, <laughs> I'll just get your attention. Um, is also that the uh, logging practices, the community of Heidelberg has spoken out harshly against logging in this area. This is a sacred place to us, and it will always be. And there was logging clear up to the backside. Roads build up to the very back of it. And um, you know if you have some principle in your life, I think as a Native person, one of the things you are taught is the preciousness and the sacredness of your land and your resources. And if you don't take a stand on that, especially with these numbers, showing you how delicate the n everything is to the environment here, then you really don't have principles or ethics or you weren't taught well. There's something the matter with you. So I have to say that in public. And Tony would probably say the same. That's part of his job. That's part of what he does on behalf of the Haida Nation is defending the resources. So, yeah. He may not ask me to speak for him again. <laughs> but anyways, on behalf of the HCA, thank you again, uh, Sitka Klein, for allowing us to, to be here. I've never felt so welcomed. It's really, really been good. I really appreciate it. Hello. Uh.
I told Tony he should have had door prizes. Every good native has door prizes and food. <laughs> yes, when he totally went wrong, he told us to eat. Computer plugged in. You know what? I better plug in. Plug some juice into it. I see why it's taking so long to load. It says ThinkPad right on it. I'm very um, um, glad and proud to be here. Thank you, Cal, for inviting me, and thank you, Sitka, and the whole um, clan conference um, for having this, this session. Uh, the next again. <laughs> um, we don't want to block it. I'm going to enable. I'm going wild and crazy here. There we go. Um, and uh, th there will probably be uh, people throughout this presentation that every everybody's uh, known or seen before. And this is Fred Gallant. He's no longer with us, but I'll dedicate this this talk to him. He uh, lived in Sitka for a while. I'm going to start with a, a quick set of slides, just touching base with uh, kind of what we're doing. And uh, we're trying to m maintain the customary traditional practices. Fish where there's fish, harvest what you need, share with others. So this is the priority that, that we're charged, state federal biologists are, are charged with. But it definitely gets complicated when we're getting down into the who, what, where, why, and how. Um, there's all kinds of competing um, uh, issues, let's say. And, uh, and I'll be... Uh, Ready to say that? Oops! The subsistence priority has fallen off the rack again. Just like last week, uh, it was wonderful to have this topic before the Joint Council, Federal Subsistence Board, and uh, secretaries. Um, but um, anyway, it's it's a uh, continuation of the age-old battle, you know, between those that are harvesting what they need and those that are only harvesting what they can. Anyway, I had to put the struggle, but customer traditional su uh, subsistence fishing persists, whether it's administratively legal or not, for sustenance, cultural, economic reasons. And I'll just put a temperament here. You know, it, it's not like an unlimited amount. The, the amount taken for subsistence is, is, you know, comparable to the number of households that depend on it. It's always been. I'm going to have to challenge myself here, but spawning priority, number of fish that make it back to spawn, that's that's number one. Protect the habitat, as, as we just mentioned. But number two, it takes fish to make fish. Maintaining a natural distribution. Um, uh, the talk was just about uh, you know the different runs of fish within head of lake. Absolutely. Uh, within a lot of our lake systems, we have... There's like completely different species. The early run of fish is spawning in the colder water inlet streams. The later running fish that are spawning on the, on the beaches of the lake. Anyway, my contention is if we maintain healthy stocks, uh, we, we could and can maintain healthy fisheries. Allocation will always be before us. But that's, that's our challenge here, and that's what we're doing. So here in southeast Alaska, there's 
a gazillion streams, and there's salmon in every single one of them. Might not be an adult salmon, could be a, a, re a rearing juvenile, uh, coho or something. But um, prior to what Cal mentioned, this, this quote federal takeover of subsistence in Southeast Alaska anyway, um, there really were only three places where there was ongoing or annual estimates of a sockeye escapement among the uh, 40 plus you know, uh, sockeye systems on the island areas. This is excluding the transboundary rivers and mainland. And uh, the only real one was right here at Readout Lake. Uh, Sitka Lake, we did a indexing program and we continue that to this very day. Fort Orm Lake is a coho weir. It's been there for many years and they, they also estimated the, the uh, um, uh, passage of, of sockeye into the lake. I stuck this picture in because <clears throat> here's a cooperative you know, work here between, in this case, it's a, a fish and game biologist uh, and a, a gentleman uh, from Angoon. There at Sitco Lake there. But uh, and a number of these cooperative projects, as Cal mentioned, have been going with Kowak and, and Heidelberg. Uh, they've had projects ongoing now at Hedda, but also at, at Eek and at Kowak with uh, Kassan, Organized Village of Kassan. They, they currently do work at Carta and Hatchery Creek. In Wrangell, these projects uh, have come and gone, but Salmon Bay, Toms, and Luck Lake, at Sockeye Stock Assessment Projects. The Cake, um, still doing Falls Lake. Uh, they had done Cutlicu and Gut Bay in the past. Here in Sitka, there's long-term project at Clag Lake. Uh, Readout Lake has uh, been funded in the last couple of years. They've done uh, Tumakoff and Salmon Lake. And Goon, um, all but Hasselberg projects are still going. In Huna, uh, Neva is going. We had a project at Pavlov and Hoktahin. There's also a project with a hooligan up in Yakutat that's in its second year. Um, you know, a lot of, like Cal mentioned, lots of results. <laughs> lots of reports are out there. And that's a good thing. Because, you know, getting a federal contract money for a project requires you to comply with certain things like get a report out. And uh, there's an example of a bunch of us, I think, on the dock there in Angoon. And what we did a lot of in the initial years was what we call indexing, going to a lake and uh, using marker capture as, um, project to uh, kind of index how many fish are in that lake or in that stream uh, as a relative measure year to year. So we have this project at Sitco Lake. Uh, we usually have a boat. We fish beach seines in this lake, uh, seine the sockeye. We mark them typically with uh, purple punches. Uh, we take sex length and scales. These pictures are all from the year 2001. There's uh, uh, Jack with a Jack. Um, just an example of what, uh, thanks to uh, <coughs> uh, Excel, we're able to turn the data into. Uh, we could actually, uh, with those multiple trips to that lake, we can index the escapement. In other words, I can comfortably say that in 2010, that 10,000 fish in there was definitely more fish than in 2006 or five, for instance. Anyway, uh, we indexed in Hasselberg River. We uh, did Hoktaheen Lake for, for four years. Um, here's Hoktaheen Lake again. Great place for staining off the, the inlet stream there. We also staining up in the creek. Here we're in the connecting uh, creek between the two lakes. Um, all of this is marker capture on several trips. If I'm going too fast, I'll speed up, okay? Anyway, Gut Bay Lake, um, named Gut for a reason. We did uh, try as we could to uh, do an index study in there, but uh, as you can kind of imagine, the uh, lakeshore drops right off into the abyss, so we couldn't really get our hands on fish with our beach seine so well. Um, but uh, we did do indexing at Cook Lake and several other systems. But now what we mostly did is exactly what we just mentioned. We, we put in the traditional, I would say, uh, um, um, fishing game inspired picket weirs, right? So aluminum channel, um, 10 foot EMT um, uh, electrical tubing uh, pickets. And uh, so we basically put these fences across the streams and um, counted the fish as we either dip netted them out of a trap or, or as we pulled the pickets and let them go through. Uh, here's one that has been in operation for many years, especially with the Cloak hatchery. Um, 
uh, even that weir, which is uh, one of, is one of the best uh, built weirs. I mean, it would fail, and uh, 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 during high water events, uh, I guess we put a little energy into helping them out and um, redesigned it. Uh, so the, the face of the weir is not quite so steep, so it doesn't get pushed back by the current. And that has worked ever since. Um, at Carta, um, it, it's a big, long weir, and uh, but that basic technique's been done to count how many fish are going in there. They also counted steelhead there. Uh, there's other steelhead projects. Here's an example of one at Natsu Natsuni uh, Steelhead Weir. Of course, that's in the spring, so it's cold and snowy. Uh, Hatchery Creek, uh, they've uh, put a weir in there. Everybody's probably seen that if you're going along the road. It's just below the, the road on your way to um, north. Um, Cutlaku Lake, there was a weir in there one year. Put it in, took it out, including the camp and everything else. Here's Clag. It'll be talked about later, I believe. Uh, Pinalku, a weir has been in there since uh, 2007. Just a shot of their camp. Uh, Neva, this is a project that I've been running. Um, it's near Excursion Inlet. It's a little dinky creek. Uh, when I first was kind of handed this job, I said, whoa, you know, I've been a biologist in Juneau for 20 years and I've never really even worried about Neva Creek. And uh, we had 5,000 fish the first year and 11,000 the second. And, since then, it's recognized as actually a pretty darn good producer. And I think it's a pretty darn healthy system uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but uh, here's some, a lot of these pit, um, people you see um, come back and work for us year after year after year. Some have worked since 2001. Um, here's Lyle James, a lot of people know him. He worked, uh, I believe, one year for us. So it was, his help was, was uh, greatly appreciated showed up to work at logging booths. I mean, he'd been a logger. That's what he did. And uh, in less than two and a half weeks, he was a fisher. fisheries technician. Anyway, here we are. Uh, this is uh, in late October in the lake, Neva Lake, and we're fishing a seine, and we're sampling fish for the proportion of fish that we had marked at the weir a month or so earlier. And uh, here we're uh, sampling them for mark. Cook Lake, same kind of thing. We put a, a weir in a, at the outlet of the lake. Roger Williams and his son work and fish out of the trap. We used to go up in the inlet creek and uh, sample fish for marks. Here we're walking the outlet creek. Uh, Curtis Lane, if you're into basketball, <coughs> 33 points uh, a couple week, uh, last week <laughs> in a game. Anyway, uh, here, we, here we're working, um, mending a fish net there, I think. And uh, <coughs> so I, I'm going to transition a little bit into some things we're doing better, I'd say. Some things we're observing, how the fish are behaving, what we're doing with our weir operations, uh, looking at what happened uh, in, um, um, in the past, like clinket methods for counting fish and whatnot. Uh, so what we're going to be showing is some, some improvements, I would say, in, in, in how we put our camps together, or how we run weirs. Uh, I'm not going to get into the market capture in this presentation, but um, and then forgetting weirs, using net weirs, and forget forcing the fish to m move only when we count them and let them go whenever they want. That's through fish video. So floating camp, I'll just hit on that. You probably saw that picture at, uh, at Cook Lake, but this is that same exact platform um, four years earlier. We used it three years at, at Pavlov. Um, and instead of going in, building a, a camp in the deep, dark woods and getting all the permits and whatnot, you need to do that for one. For two, that you're tramping up the area and, and there'll be evidence of your presence there for many years, uh, even if you try to keep it clean. So in some locations where there's some protected water, uh, making a basic uh, platform, in my case, uh, um, I think I have a picture of it. <laughs> anyway, a simple platform on floats, on styrofoam logs, uh, works great. Uh, in this case, we're at, uh, at Cook Lake. We, we dismantled that one at Pavlov and put it together at Cook Lake. Um, and uh, the crew's actually able to move the tent right down in front of the weir and count fish through or whatever in their in their tennis shoes if they wanted. 
And uh, the lower picture is uh, a couple of bears in there. And this is typical of a lot of weir projects. So it, it, when you put a weir, in a, particularly in a stream, but in this case too, at the outlet of a lake, it, they tend to be uh, bear feeding stations. It, you, have, you have slowed the migration of, of salmon into the lake, which concentrates them. And we'll see, but fish basically are, are trying to go, and you're only letting them go when you're actively passing them. Anyway, if you had a floating camp, the only onshore disturbance uh, might be uh, the commode, where Tom Mill Sr. Is, uh, has just finished there. Uh, here, uh, we're on a tent platform a few years ago, uh, doing the paperwork. That's just an example of the frame. It's a simple aluminum channel frame, just like you use to make the weir out of fire from logs, aluminum pipe. Uh, we made bunks out of wood back then. So um, our new ones now, we've got all aluminum bunks and stuff. Like at the Neva, I essentially made that one a couple years ago with no wood. Using plastic flooring and whatnot. So basically my intention there is that something that could last, who knows, 20 years at different locations. And it's all designed to fit in an otter. Anyway we would often find ourselves in situations where <clears throat> you didn't know if the bear was going to visit you <laughs> at any point of the day or night so you end up putting electric fences around and whatnot and once you switch to a floating camp it's not not nearly such an issue another cool thing that we discovered uh, i first tried it at cart actually is uh, putting the trap in the weir and i insist on that in all weir projects now the the face of the weir and the side of the trap make a natural V entrance into the trap. And all you have to do is lift one picket eight inches up and you've got a almost a one-way passage for fish into the trap. They try to get out on the upstream and downstream side. And that's kind of what you want. You don't want them going in and out of your trap, sulking for a couple of days or a week or something before they move. Anyway, when you want them to move, um, do the trap and weir, just like that's shown. It saves you material. Um, here's the crew from last year at Carta. And Jeff Bell, who a lot of people know, is uh, working as the, the project leader. I'm giving it a little, I don't know if this will work. Uh oh. Yeah, this is not looking good. <laughs> anyway, I have a bunch of uh, video clips in here. The, um, the lesson here it is. But um, this is just an example, <coughs> happened to be me, but um, of what is this slowed down for some reason. I'm actually moving faster than this in real time. But um, it's Cal's uh, ThinkPad's thinking about it, I think. But um, basically, this is this is your you know traditional operating a weir. In this case, there are about 10 to 1 pink salmon, the sockeye there. They're trying to get upstream, and, and even if you had two people in the trap, it'd be hard to, hard to get them all to move in the time that you had. So uh, we need better way. And so what if what if we used a net weir instead of a picket weir? Um, tremendous cost savings, not only on materials but in deploying it. So anyway, a funnel-shaped net. Um, put a trap on the leading edge, and so this is what we did at uh, Cook Lake in 2006. Uh, Kendra Caesar came and helped us for a little bit there. Um, here's some underwater picture upper left. You can see the net weir is kind of shaped where the fish just funnels the fish right in through the trap. And typically we have both ends of the trap open and they just swim right through if we had the video on the other end. In this case, I think we were, we're trapping them and counting them. And a couple weeks after we deployed it, uh, we had uh, one of those big high water events that affected weirs in the area. Um, totally ruined our kook lake weir. Uh, but if, I don't know if you can see it, but you can see the cork line for that net weir just underwater there. Um, and uh, even with this eighth inch cable, it, it withstood that storm A-OK. -okay. So here's our, like our early fish video stuff. We just literally attached cameras on <laughs> each side of an open picket. Put the um, little DVR size of a, uh, I don't know, a pack of cigarettes or whatever um, on the upper right uh, in a waterproof case. Uh, the camera's tilted a little bit 
So it makes it look like the fish are swimming downstream. It, 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 you could, the camera's angle. But this is like some of the very first video we got. And what's really neat is a lot of it's just like this. Uh, it's, it's amazing how well this works, particularly at the outlets of lakes where you're out of the rushing water of the stream. You're in that kind of that choir to water of the lake, and those fish want to move. They're on a mission to make it up in the lake, basically sound where the water's deeper and they're ripen up, and then, they, um, then they'll move up onto the spawning areas in, in about a month. So here in, in Neva Inlet Creek, you can look, some of these fish are missing their adipose fins. So instead of physically going up in the stream and dip netting them and examining them for these marks we put on at the weir, which is, is around the corner there, I uh, used fish video to, to sample, and I could sample a whole bunch. Here's a, one with a missing adipose fin. Here's one with its adipose fin. So we're getting better, actually. This is inside an aluminum video shoot. I think this one's missing its fin. So anyway, it's fairly simple to, to sample them. Here we put cameras on each side of the uh, clock weir. Um, we counted fish through. That's um, the system basically the recorder we've been using, but I may have a very uh, much simpler, uh, I guess, box. I just use a plain old battery box now. At Canal Crew Falls, uh, we wanted to know how many fish were making it over that falls if it was a barrier to migration. So we put in a couple of what I call stream net weirs upstream. Each one of them have, have a video shoot. One's right next to my ankles there. The other one's down. With two cameras on each one, so a double redundant system. Uh, it's kind of neat. Both years we did that, 2008 and 9, you know, 95% of the fish pass between 11 at night and 3 in the morning. Those aren't hours people operate weirs, I'll tell you that. <coughs> and uh, so, um, yeah, anyway, just another example where here we're comparing in 2009 with the video counts were related to the picket weir counts that were upstream. And you can see a fairly consistent uh, two or three day lag there. Uh, uh, in between is that falls. You're just, we threw the equipment in at uh, the Lace River uh, in uh, Burners Bay. And when the hooligan came, it was awesome. We put a time lapse on that. So we took like a minute of video eight times a day during daylight hours. And that would tell you when they're there and how long they're there. Uh, and if you wanted, you could count. But <laughs> anyway, Cook Lake, 2010, we basically went afresh. Uh, did full-on dueling net weirs, no picket weir at all, floating camp. Uh, everything's double redundant. Two shoots, two cameras on each one, uh, independent power systems. So if something fails, at least you got the other one kind of thing. And it's instant validation. Um, just the design of the different nets that we're using. They're all just basic funnel-shaped nets. In this case, we're using nylon nets, uh, fairly cheap and fairly uh, very durable. Um, picture of a underwater video shoot. They've got lights on them and mostly you don't know if your video or is being taken in the middle of night or during the day because the, the lighting is very good. The, um, uh, the, the video itself is a date time stamp on it so you'll know exactly when the footage was taken and it's cheap and you can buy it right off the internet. And this is one piece of the video review that's important, I think, is side by side, you and your, your crew mate, you're reviewing the same footage. One's looking at the left camera, one's looking at the right camera. You're looking at the same hour from, say, midnight to one in the morning. And, um, and you're recording your counts on your data book. And in this case, for the lower shoot, and you'll have a column for the upper shoot. And you'll look, and all your numbers are the same. And you've essentially, right then, validated your estimate of escapement, um, unlike needing to wait a year later after you finally figured out all the marker capture stuff. Um, so just example of Cook video from 2010. No, I can't see that. Anyway, this is what good fish video is. Uh, the fish is triggering its motion detection, so the fish is triggering each each uh, saving of a, of a video clip. Um, Anyway, just examples of the data. We basically have a couple styrofoam logs, use an old weird channel to make a float, stick a couple solar panels on it, and that's our uh, the, at the upper end of our um, net weir. Here's what I call the mystery fish. Uh, 
and you guys all know what that was. Anyway, that's another cool thing about this. Here we're counting dollies and they come through in swarms. We would never count these fish at a, at a normal weir. Um, at Neva Lake, we bagged the uh, picket weir down in the deep dark you know, woods for this, uh, this double weir video shoot on each one. Our floating camp is, is just out there. It's white. So uh, instead of trapping fish like we used to, we're just looking at the video. Back to Falls Lake again, uh, here at Jen Conant's fishing game uh, back in 2001. Uh, they were doing marker capture at the top of the fish pass. I found this spot picture that kind of reminded me where in 2002 was, um, I think, my first effort to try to do a net weir where we had a trap on each side of the outlet of Falls Lake. And that net weir essentially guided fish that came up the natural falls. Um, and it worked there, but I like the design we're using way better uh, now. Here's a shot where we go fly in there. We have a bunch of net. We attach the corks and leads. In this case, we had to deploy that the lake one, the outer one, uh, outside of all these logs that are there. Um, so that's where we were in 2010. Here's a picture of underwater. This is the uh, exciting footage that Justin had to deal with. Basically, that shoot was out in the lake. There was no real flow there. The lights are on it, right? So the uh, lights attracted the phytoplankton, attracted the zooplankton, attracted the, these sticklebacks, which were actually feeding away there. So uh, it didn't work so good. But what we kind of found that if you play your video back at 32 times speed, these fish will go away when a big fish goes through. So that's that's how it, it works. And then in 2011, we doubled it up. There's another net weir uh, just above the outlet there. I don't know if you can see it, but that's the operation there. Here I am back at Readout Lake. Uh, same thing, make a net. We put in the world's largest net weir there. Uh, we also, uh, uh, in 2010, put one over the trap uh, side of the weir. Um, here we are in 2011, uh, moved it up, and we have plans to, to do an even more complete weiring uh, for this coming year. Stream net weir design is, is as the diagram shows, basically, all these net weirs have the same feature, that the, the netting sails back in the current. So you're not trying to hold anything up to the current, nothing to catch debris or anything. They're self-cleaning. So we put one of those in at Hatchery Creek. Uh, you could see the picket weir underneath the bridge there. You can see the, the pickets from the picket weir. Um, so they're marking their fish there, and we're examining them for marks and counting them all at the, at the net weir. Here, TARS is putting a, a video shoot part on the, on the net. Um, last year they had a flood event late in the year and the net we are held fine. Here's something we're scheming for this coming year at the outlet of Sitco Lake to put in a couple of net weirs and uh, have a radio modem system in there where it'll send us pictures of the project site underwater and above so we'll know that it's as we left it each day. We're trying to use our radio system to do that. Uh, wish us luck. If we can't get it to work, we're not going to do it. In other words, we're going to take the crew that works at Cook Lake, they're going to count both the total number of fish into Sitco and Cook Lake for the price it cost us just to do one lake. Anyway, we're going to double up the effort there. That's just the different ways we're doing things. So here's a slide I've used before. It's, it's just funny, right? Fish counting evolution going from Mr. Geico to Bill Gates, you know? and. Um, and that, that's cool, but you know, I was thinking just this morning, I got it wrong. It's actually, we were going from the way we would do it, right? Forcing the fish to, allowing the fish to pass only when we want to. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, with these barriers across streams. Um, and, uh, but now if we look, if we look back at traditional ways, link it in other oops, areas, um, you know, Alaska, um, uh, you see, their their old weirs are always in these V shapes, and there's a lot of funneling and, and cones and things. And so we're, I, I know that I uh, was um, appreciated by a computer. Anyway, some of those designs when we're going in with uh, the net weirs and whatnot. And that's what I have. Thank you. Oh, there's Charles. That was
<laughs> Hiding in the back. Um, Mike, you had a quick question? Yes. Um, we have collected DNA uh, uh, samples in the past from these projects. You know, Fish and Game has come to us and asked us to collect samples for them, and we have them. It's not part of the project, but it's wherever we can help, we can. Okay, next is Charles Russell. He's with Sitka Tribe of Alaska. Did you have a... Yeah. yeah. I'll pull this out. Okay. Yeah. 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 Talk about that. Uh, my name's uh, Charles Russell. Sorry, I'm late. Uh, I'm gonna try to. I'm not gonna have as as long as a uh, long as the last one, but uh, I'll try to keep you enthralled. Um, I work for City Tribe Alaska, and I do the Clag Lake Sockeye Salmon Stock Assessment pro Project. Um, brief history of uh, the Clag Project. Um, it's uh, located approximately six, six miles north of uh, Sitka, and it's on the west side of Chigoff Island. All the maps coming up here soon, and it's one of the largest producers of sockeye salmon in Southeast Alaska. Um, it was historically used by clans living in the area, uh, Sitka area, and continues to be an important subsistence resource for the people of Sitka. Um, but in 2000, the Sitka Tribe of Alaska, U.S. Forest Service, and ADF and G, and responded to concerns about potential overharvest of Clag Lake sockeye stocks by initiating the sockeye monitoring project Clag Lake beginning in 2001. Um, this is kind of a rough picture. Uh, I, uh, I thought I was going to present on Sunday, so <laughs> didn't have time to update it. But uh, basically, Clag Bay is right there on the left, and then the Clag Lake would be the, the lake in the center with uh, there's three sh smaller lakes below it and a, str and a stream. I wish I had a freezer point or something to point out. But uh, uh, that would be the, uh, the study site. Uh, and, and the location of Sitka, um, you can see Sitka is all the way down on the, the left-hand side here, all the way at the bottom of the screen. Uh, and then uh, Clag Bay is all the way up right there on the west side of Chigdong. So, yeah. Uh, anyways, it's the Atabos uh, Bay and a system of inland saltwater bays or lagoons, which is, includes Lake Anna and Sister Lake. Um, every year, uh, we start a simple picket rich weir about 100 meters upstream from the estuary. Um, this year, I, I, in years past, we'd always, uh, I guess, the, the project always had a, uh, a trap with a with a funnel, and I just decided I just wasn't going to deal with that funnel, so I inset the the weir this year, which actually seemed to help with the fish uh, moving into the trap and moving upstream faster. Uh, this is kind of a, this is just as we finish getting it uh, set up, so it's kind of a little rough, but you get an idea of, of, uh, of, of what, it, uh, what it does. Um, here's a, we also were able to get a new trap this year, a um, metal trap. The old one was waterlogged, made out of wood, and <laughs> just kind of looked like something out of a horror movie. So. Uh, this new trap helped a, helped a lot with uh, with fish passage. So uh, basically, fisheries the technicians, as uh, some of the other presentations probably already said, uh, basically the fisheries technicians count the fish as they move to the weir and ensure the escaping goals are being met. Uh, we take lengths and scale samples uh, daily, um, uh, predetermine amount of fish necessary, uh, and then I try to disperse the, the scale sampling and uh, the ASL sampling over the over the season. 20% um, of our sockeye that migrate through the weir are marked with a fin clip for the mark recapture study that's done at the end of the season to ensure that the weir counts are uh, accurate. So, uh, and uh, the technicians also do on-site creel surveys uh, to estimate sport and subsistence harvest. Um, here would be a picture of uh, one of our technicians 
uh, counting, uh, uh, doing the mark recapture uh, study at the end of the season. Basically, we go through and find all the uh, dead fish, and if it has counted it has a mark, and then count it doesn't have a mark. So, uh, so sport and subsistence use. In 2011, over 11,772 sockeye returned to Flag Bay. This was uh, the third lowest uh, total since the project began, but uh, still within uh, within the uh, acceptable statement. Um, uh, the estimated subsistence and support harvest in 2011 from on-site drill surveys was 5,000 over, was fi over 5,000 sockeye salmon, which was actually down from the previous year, 5,800 salmon. Um, on average, since 2000, uh, 2009, 2010, and 2011, 30% of returning sockeye at Clyde Lake have been harvested by subsistence and support users. This is actually uh, uh, quite an increase from 2000 since the project. Uh, started in 2001 to 2008 where it was only about 17% of returning fish were harvested by subsistence and sport. So here's just a little thing to tell you. Uh, basically, uh, future of Clyde Bay, the monitoring needs to be continued to ensure adequate sockeye salmon escapement uh, in the Clyde Bay. Um, uh, we have concerns that maybe an increased harvest coupled with a low return year as uh, if, I go, if I go back, 2008 was a low return year. I think only uh, 4,800 fish made it up the stream, yet 40% of the, the, the fish were, were harvested. Uh, so we, we think that maybe a low return year could have drastic effects on the sustainability of this, of this fishery. Uh, Clag Bay is a kind of a, uh, it's a highly fluid I guess, system. It needs a lot of rain in order for the fish to run up the stream. If you have a dry year, the fish just hold up. And uh, a lot of the fish will end up uh, yeah, just holding up in the bay before they get a chance to run upstream. As I think with this year, about 80% of the fish were harvested before we even had 100 fish upstream. So uh, 5,000 fish, 4,000 fish were harvested before you know we had significant statement upstream. Um, what else we got? And SDA hopes to continue this project in the future. Those are my most important research. Um, I think that's my deal. Yeah, I. <laughs> I thought I was presenting on Sunday, so I didn't have time to throw a lot of pictures and videos in. But um, I guess uh, there any questions or anything else? Yeah. Um, our, uh, the on-site monitoring, we, we get this, all the sport users and all the subsistence users that come to Flag Bay. We, we try to, as soon as they get there, we go out, we tell them, we tell them you know, come over to us, tell them any, how many you've harvested. Um, it's uh, real important, I guess, to get the, get the accurate counts uh, for that system because, again, uh, if you have a bad a bad year and no fish have made it upstream yet due to low rainfall, uh, you could end up uh, impacting the, 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 the stock. Yeah. So, uh, as in, in years past, like, I think they closed it in 08 because there were 6,000 fish harvested and only 1,000 upstream. So, it's, uh, yeah, it's a highly variable system. Uh, Continued monitoring, on-site monitoring is really, is, uh, really needed. I'm with uh, the Sick of Alaska, so yeah, they run the project jointly with the U.S. Fish and, Fish and Wildlife and ADF. So. Yeah, the FNG. I, I I report to Troy I can go over at ADFNG. I give my numbers daily and. We, we kind of work back and forth on the water level and how what's going on with the uh, subsistence harvest, harvesting, and uh, then we, we try to make an accurate uh, uh, or a good decision on whether to close it or keep it open. So. Um, with the water, oh, oh you know it's uh, um, yeah. <laughs> To find out, yeah, I guess so. I mean, this increased harvest has been happening since 08, so it's, uh, um, you know, we have, we, you know, there are concerns that, uh, that taking so much from the beginning of the stock is, you know, might affect it genetically or, you know, it might detriment it in the future, but we're, we're right now it's, uh, it seems to be doing okay. You know, our main concern is that, again, in 2008, it was a low year, and it, if it's really hard, to, I guess, to, to know how many fish are returning when you're almost taking. All, you're taking all the fish prior to any escapement upstream. Yeah. <laughs> well.
No, no. Uh, not that we know. Yeah, uh, the, the peak of the run kind of starts in, uh, well again, it all depended on water and in, in, in stream levels, but uh, it seems like it starts around uh, the end of July to, through the middle of August. So, uh, but most of the fish are taken before they even, in, you know, before any escapement has occurred on the uh, On some years, it, it's a bigger escapement, I would say. I'm not sure about harvest levels, I haven't seen harvest. Are there um, are there any other questions for the panel that? Uh, um, as far as you know, chemicals and stuff, that's not something we're really monitoring in these projects. Um, uh, you know, we do have. In other parts of the forest, we do have programs to deal with abandoned mines abandon and mine, you know, the stuff to get off that. But uh, as far as this program goes, we don't do much of that. But there's other parts of the forest that we deal with. Really, the important about the funding sources because. Even without the funding that this relationship built, if there wasn't that funding, which is sitting, it's low, it's low again. There's no any good way to monitor it anyway. You know, they just did some good monitoring. And, and you think that you want to continue something that you know really helps out, but again, it would be a subsistence. I think that's uh, Lisa brings up a good point. I mean, uh, and this is something I noticed, you know, every village out there, you know, they're not harvesting from any one stream, they're not harvesting from the Swedish stream, maybe three or four or five streams around the communities that they're harvesting. And like Lisa said, they go around the where the abundance is, right? Don't fish it in the fish, it's just where the fish are. And for whatever reason, for whatever reason, on an annual basis, that may change. You end up moving around to all these different systems. It would be, it'd be great if, we can afford to, to have every village have a, a monitoring program like this on every one of those systems around their village. Um, the villages, that would be, in my mind, the ideal. We just don't have the funding to support that right now. Um, you know, if we get one person in the we get one. Um, so that's kind of where we're at now. Just trying to maintain the investments of the system. So many projects have been going on for 10 years now, you kind of hate to walk away from them, because that's a beautiful data set that you don't want to you want to add to, you don't want to just walk away from it and lose that data. So in my mind, it's important to keep that data set going for time. Kind of what happened here at Readout, uh, you know, they had a, a 20 plus years of, of data at Readout, now they have this really good model set up so that the depth that the run is going to be based on what the run looks like really in the season, so they have a, a, a really fine-tuned management system for readout, and that's only based on having this 20 plus years of data. Um, and it'd be great to have that same data set on all these systems so we can get a better job of managing the uh, Anyway, any Are there any other questions? I guess if not, I guess uh, we'll wrap that. Um, um, you know, we'll be around to answer more questions if folks have anything more, but uh, I really appreciate your time and attention to this, and I, I think it's an important part of our cooperative relationship with tribes and Southeast and uh, uh, for the forces. And, and, uh, it, it pays, I like to think of it, it, it pays off not only today and, and what we do on, you know, over the summer and in the communities and all, but I think over, over the long term it's going to have a payoff because We'll be able, you know, 20 years down the road, we'll be able to look, look back and see this, this, uh, you know, 20 plus years of data that we're collected cooperatively, and that everybody, uh, everybody buys off on and everybody uses it. I think that's that's the benefit. That's the long term benefit. So, Mike, and then Carol. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Carol.
Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how that's going to work, or, or how. Um, you know, I'm not really in the land exchange program. I, I, there's lo folks from the local office here that might be able to answer better, but um, I would hope that there would be um, easements and that sort of thing there, so that we protect the area, the fishing area for, for subsistence users and, and that sort of thing. I would hope that that would be put in place. That there's some sort of protection for the subsistence users so that they can get in there and fish and harvest and, and uh, not be afraid of trespassing on private land or whatever. Fish and Game at that meeting made a commitment to work with the tribe and work with us to, or work with the feds to, you know, kind of do what they should have done back in 2009 when Smith came to the Board of Fish with their proposal to begin with. Um, I'm hoping that's going to help, that, you know, if, well, I don't know, if, ever since I started this program, the federal, the federal fisheries program, federal and I've heard the state say, well, we have a subsistence priority, let us manage that for that priority, and then said, you won't have to worry because we'll be managing the priority. And I kind of understand that, but for this to work in this dual, quote, dual management system that we have, for it to work, for that to work, both the state and the feds have to be implementing our laws and our regulations the way they should be for it to work. And if one or the other is not implementing their laws and regulations the way they should, then the system falls apart. And I think in this case, maybe that's what happened. Um, that both the state and the feds have a responsibility to work together and provide that priority like they're supposed to under both our sets of laws. So now that's just my soapbox speech. <laughs> that's how I kind of feel about it. I really believe that we both have to, both the state and the feds have to be implementing our laws and regulations the way we're, the way they're, we're supposed to be. And if we're not, we're not serving the public, we're not serving our communities that we're supposed to be serving. But, but probably Ben has something to add to that because he's been, he's been involved with this chat and straight for a long time. Yeah, just, I, I just want us to put our biologist hat on when we, when we go think about what can we do to make sure we get more fish 
back into the bays to meet the needs of both the spawners and, and the subsistence needs. And oh, oh. anyway, anyway, um, thanks to these subsistence projects we had at Falls Lake in particular, and at at the uh, Canal Coo and Cook. Uh, also, we basically have found that these sockeye are coming into those bays and into the creek in basically um, late June, July, August, and into September. Okay, that, and we know that um, like the very first year at Falls Lake was great because we had the very first fish come up the fish ladder uh, the day the subsistence fishery closed on July 31st. Um, anyway, um, uh, um, we know when those fish are moving through Icy Strait and Chatham Strait, and you're exactly right, that is the primary route of their migration. We know that from, from years of tagging studies, years of watching where the fishermen fish. Not only are they coming through those locations, but they're coming through within a set of the beach. They're, they're following the shore very close. So we know those things. Um, and, and then we ask ourselves, well, when does the fishing occur? Well, it occurs June, July, and August. So there's this broad overlap, unavoidable broad overlap in when, those, when and where those soccer are migrating and when and where the fishery occurs. And all that matters is how many are making it back to the bay like from the results of these projects. And if you don't have enough making it back to the bay, the, the bottom line is you need to moderate the, the seine effort in those areas those fish are passing through. And I would suspect that we will never find any fine tuning. Because if those fish are not caught at uh, like down for Falls Lake, for instance, if they're not caught in the Hidden Falls, quote, terminal hatchery harvest area, they might very well be caught on the Basket Bay shore off of Tenneke. They might very well be caught freshwater shore or at Augusta or at Whitewater. They are indeed being caught in all those places. And the bottom line is you have to moderate how hard you fish in those highly mixed stock areas. If you're going to uh, want to avoid over harvesting or translation, um, maintain a subsistence priority uh, for the, the salmon that are bound for the basin streams important to Rangoon and, and Cape and, and other communities. I, I'm just saying, it's, it's not going to be, I, I, I suspect that genetic stock ID is not going to tell us anything that we don't already know now. And what we know now is we need to moderate the same effort. In other words, not ask them necessarily to close or whatever, ask them to shift effort closer to where those fish are going. None of those fish are going to those places I just mentioned. They're not going along the Admiralty Shore. There's no sockeye system there. Um, the, the fish they're targeting are pink salmon. And there's going to need to be a shift in effort towards um, Tenneke and Peril, uh, Hood, Chaik, Whitewater, Seymour, wherever the abundance of pink salmon warrant their, their targeting and fishing. And um, so anyway, that's the, it's, it's, nothing's new there. We've known this since uh, basically the early 60s in our struggle to manage this, you know, uh, passing stock and local stock fishing. All right. Well, thanks for all your attention. I guess uh, we're right on time. So, wow, we did good.